Well, you have probably heard the phrase, go to hell. That's not very nice, actually. But you've probably heard it. But today, we're going to visit hell, in a manner of speaking. We're going to visit and learn some details about it. And we're going to need to be traveling today in a time machine. So be sure and stay with us and don't miss uh, the different uh, locations as we go from place to place in time. As we uh, study Isaiah today, we'll be studying different periods of human history and jumping around as Isaiah does in his writings. So something that uh, a lot of things we'll be touching on and learning today. But as you know, we start with our popular quiz. So wherever you like to take your quiz, whether it's on the back of your prayer request form <coughs> or someplace else, and make sure you have uh, <clears throat> no handouts or cheat sheets or anything in front of you, because that does not please God, right? When you cheat on your popular quiz. <laughs> All right. So one, two, three, and B. One, two, three, and B for your quiz. All right. Uh, this section that we start today is going to uh, be the start of the oracles. And today in our lesson we studied the first oracle. Who's that oracle against in our lesson today? Who's the oracle against? That's number one. Who's the oracle against? Okay, number two. What is the place of the dead called? The place of the dead, what's it called? We're studying a lot today about that. Number three, what is the term for the future period of time of God's judgment? What's the term used in our lesson for the future period of time that is God's judgment? And I'll give you a clue, it's four words. <coughs> Four words that is the future period of time of God's judgment. Four words. And then the bonus question. Was the Tower of Babel built before or after the flood? You may have to do your motions. <laughs> The Tower of Babel, was it built before or after the flood? Okay, let's see how we did here. Number one, we're going to be studying ten different oracles. Today we study the first one. Who's the oracle against? Babylon. Babylon. <clears throat> right. Number two, the place of the dead is called? A shield. A shield. It's like you say the word shield, but leave the D off. Shield. Shield. Uh, number three, the term for the future period of time when God judges the earth. Day of the Lord. Day of the Lord. There are different words for that time period. The tribulation, time of Jacob's tribulation, time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. Lots of different names. But the one in our lesson today that uses the name the Day of the Lord. And the Tower of Babel, was it built before or after the flood? After. After, okay, if we remember our emotion. So the Tower of Babel was when the scattering of the nations, you know, so we've got creation, fall, flood, and then the scattering of the nations at the Tower of Babel. Okay, um, so just very humbly go like this if you got most of them right. Just kind of very humbly. <laughs> I just like to see how you're doing. Humbly, all glory to God. Okay, all right, good. <clears throat> Well, let's talk about quickly where we've been in our book of Isaiah here. So chapters 1 through 5 actually occurred after chapter 6, but chapters 1 through 5, the introduction, the prologue, where we learned that Isaiah prophesied during the reign of, of four kings. Hopefully you know them very well and could even say them, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. We learned a lot in those first five chapters about the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom and their sin, their rebellion, their apostasy. We also learned a lot about a, a, a coming remnant and future restoration, but they rejected the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 6 was when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and he was commissioned to go and be God's messenger and spokesperson knowing that the people would not listen. 
And then Isaiah 7 through 12 finishes up that first section on the kings of Judah. And Isaiah met with King Ahaz, told him he didn't need to fear, he could trust God, but instead Ahaz went to the king of Assyria for help. We learned about the judgment coming on Israel and then that judgment coming on Assyria. We learned about the branch and the future government that would be on, uh, the Messiah would reign forever. So a lot of uh, good news in there and learning about the millennial kingdom and what that would be like. So today we start the next segment in Isaiah, which is chapters 13 through 23. And those chapters give us the oracles, these 10 oracles against <coughs> different nations. So I would like for you to take your handout um, from your appendix that has Isaiah at a glance. which is page 285. All right, so stick with me here as we go through this. This is where you write your different chapter themes as we go along, and I've been giving you your chapter themes to some degree, but on chapter 13, which is today, we're gonna to be studying, you can put the oracle regarding Babylon, the oracle regarding Babylon, and then for chapter 14, a taunt against Babylon, a taunt against Babylon for 14. This is on page 285, Isaiah at a glance. Now, if you look in, up in the right-hand top of the chart, you see three columns. The first column is typed in for you, Kings of Judah. See that? We're starting the second column today. And that, so in that little space there, the second column next to kings of Judah, for the second column, write in oracles, oracles. And that's chapters 13 through 23, 13 through 23. And then you have that thin column. You might want to put a, like a squiggle line or something down to chapter 12 where they have a line because there are no oracles in chapters 1 through 12. So nothing should be written in 1 through 12. There are no oracles. They don't start till 13. So you might want to just do a, you know, a line or something to show there aren't any. But when we get down to chapter 13, where we are today, and we already wrote oracle regarding Babylon, in that column under oracles, you might want to write Babylon. And you may already have done so because this is part of your homework. If you, uh, your homework on page 84, we're not going to turn there now, but if you did not do that part of your homework, this is what it entails. It gives you 10 different references and tells you to put them on this sheet at the correct chapter. We'll do that later, um, and we'll be referring to that week by week as we get to them. So the Oracle Against Babylon is all of chapter 13 and most of chapter 14. It goes through 1427, and then it, uh, there's a different topic there at that time. So we're going to be learning all about this Oracle Against Babylon. And remember that Isaiah wrote this 150 years uh, before Babylon would invade Judah. Isaiah was not alive when Babylon invaded Judah, when Judah was carried off into captivity. But God gave him a lot of information about it. So let's look at the map of uh, the big picture of the Middle East, which is page 303. I hope you always keep these handy because we refer to them a lot. So page 303, the big picture of the Middle East. Today we're going to be talking about Babylon, which is pretty much in the middle of your map. You see where it says Iraq. So Babylon uh, used to be in what is modern day Iraq. Babylon uh, uh, became a big empire. It's also called Chaldea. So when you hear about the Chaldeans or Chaldea, that's another word for that same empire, in that same area. And we're gonna be talking today about um, the Tower of Babel and about the, the city of Babylon. And so that would have been right around near where the word Iraq is. It's in ruins today. There is no city of Babylon today, but right around where that word Iraq is, somewhere right there is where Babylon would have been. Uh, the Tower of Babel would have been. And right, uh, right across the, um, where those two rivers are the narrowest, the closest together, the Euphrates and the Tigris, right near where it says Iraq, you see those, uh, those rivers narrow down. On the, uh, the east 
So on the Tigris River, where they're real narrow, right there would be Baghdad, a current day Baghdad, right there. So you can kind of get an idea of where Babylon was in relation to where Baghdad is today. And then, if you look further to the east, you see what, in what is modern day Iran, you see Media, so that's the nation of the Medes, Media. And then if you look all the way at the bottom, uh, right hand corner, you see Persia. So those two nations, empires, and they are going to ally together and become the Medo-Persians. The Medo-Persians are going to ally together. But again, when we talk about them, that's where they are, and that is what is uh, modern-day Iran. All right, let's look on page 83 of our workbook. Page 83. See where we are? The top chart there with the arrow going down shows us we're um, about the middle of Ahaz when he co-reigned with his son Hezekiah. So you can see in there time-wise where we are. And then on the prophetic points of history, this is where we need to add in between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. We need to add in there the tribulation because that will occur between those two on your chart there, the tribulation. That's going to be Isaiah 13 and 14. Talks a lot about the tribulation. So if you just want to kind of add that in there. And then Christ's second coming and reign of Christ, that would be chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 14, 1 through 3. So it kind of gives us some reference point there as to when, when some of these things. Now, Isaiah is going to be all over the place. We're going to learn about things in his day. We're going to learn about things impending soon. And then he's going to also tell us about things in the far off future for him, not necessarily so for us, but for him as far as that tribulation and millennial time. So he's going to be all over the, the place today. And the question of the week here, which is not one of your discussion questions, just talks about we live in the present, but do we want to even know what's going to happen in the future? And a lot of what we're talking about today is about the future. What ha does God have planned for the whole world? He tells us a lot of details so that we can see, even now, as things are each day closer and closer to God's, uh, the end of the world as we know it, to the end of human history as we know it, and, and what all will happen. However, we don't, do not have to fear that. God tells us over and over, do not fear. We have hope, and our hope is in the character of God. I want to just quickly give you an acronym for the word hope that keeps our focus on the Lord, kind of goes along with our memory verse that our focus needs to be on the Lord, and we will have peace if we focus on the Lord. So if we take the word hope, and we're going to have each one of those letters stand for something about God that gives us hope. So the first um, word is, goes with the letter H is holy. He is holy, and we've talked about what that means. He is pure and just and ethical and perfect. He never will do anything wrong. He never makes any mistakes. Um, everything he does is righteous and just, and we can trust him. So we can have hope because God is holy. Second letter O stands for omnipotence. Omnipotence, all power, complete power. So our God can do anything. He is sovereign. He's in control of all. And we've been seeing that week after week as we study Isaiah, the omnipotence, the power of God. The letter P stands for the fact that he is preeminent, preeminent. He is exalted above all. Jesus Christ is the worthy king of kings and lord of lords. He is preeminent, and that gives us hope. He is above all else. And the letter E, eternal. Um, we, we sing about that in our song. He, he is eternal. He uh, will never be defeated. He will reign forever. We will be with him forever. His character will never change. He is eternal. So God is holy. He's omnipotent. He is preeminent. And he is eternal. And these things give us hope. Great hope. All right, well, grab your observation sheets. And uh, let's get into our text here. We're on Isaiah 13, which in, on your sheet starts on page 205. I hope you've been uh, able to spend some time uh, studying these chapters and, and learning a lot. And we'll all, um, we're all learning together. 
and that is, has been um, very interesting and very helpful. Well, we've already learned that God used Assyria to crush Israel and take them into captivity. And then we learned that God judged Assyria for crushing Israel. Uh, they were very cruel and ruthless, and, and they were just a tool of God. God used the fact that they were cruel and ruthless to punish his people, but then punished Assyria for being cruel and ruthless. And then uh, God used Babylon, the Babylonian kingdom, to crush Assyria. Uh, so Babylon was a tool of God. Um, they crushed Assyria. Um, and then Babylon captured Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, we haven't studied too many details about that. And we will study more. But they, uh, they are going to, in 586 BC, um, they're going to go in and, and crush um, and destroy Jerusalem and take everyone off into captivity. And so because of their cruelty, Babylon is then going to be destroyed. And God is going to use the Medo-Persian Empire to destroy Babylon. And we'll be talking about that today. And so this chapter 13, uh, again, we're going to be jumping around time-wise, but it has to do with the historic city of Babylon, the, the nation of Babylon, the empire of Babylon. But it also has to do with in the end times when God destroys Babylon. So the end times destruction of Babylon and and uh, that will be the world system that the man has set up, but also the capital city of the Antichrist. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So these words that Isaiah wrote and told the people were not heard by these different nations that the oracles were against for the most part. This one's against Babylon. The people in Babylon didn't hear these words, but they were given so that the kingdoms at that time, the southern, northern and southern kingdoms, would see what was going to happen. It gave them hope. Uh, they heard that there would be a remnant. They also learned more about God and hearing about what God would, would do. And then when they saw God do it, when they saw these prophecies actually occurred, it helped them and should help us realize that the future prophecies that have not occurred yet will be fulfilled because God already fulfilled the things he did say he would do. So Babylon was not a threat in Isaiah's day. It was a weaker country. Uh, but it's going to grow in power, as we will see. So a lot of what we're going to be studying today is God's final justice against evil and wickedness and the world system that defies God and lives in rebellion against God. And we're going to be learning about the day of the Lord, which is God's final judgment on this earth, which we call the tribulation. All right, now we're ready. So we start in verse 1, the oracle... Remember, the word oracle actually means burden. So it would be similar like to a woe. You're going to have this woe. You're going to have this burden. It means a, The actual word actually means burden. But it is a declaration. So this is a declaration, which is going to be a burden for them, concerning Babylon. Now this is the first time in Isaiah that the word Babylon has been used. But it's certainly not a new word to the Bible. So... You have a handout that says Babylon Timeline on it. So grab that. We're going to write all over this thing. So again, stay with me. I'm going to give you a lot of information to write on here to help us understand as we go through our lesson today. So on the far left, you have 3500 B.C., and that's approximate. You'll find different dates. But uh, that's by the line that says uh, Babel, Genesis 11. That refers to the Tower of Babel. So that's about when the Tower of Babel was built. That was built by Nimrod. Nimrod was the great grandson of Noah. He was the um, Noah's son Ham, and then Ham had Cush, and then Cush had Nimrod. The word Nimrod means rebel, and Nimrod was a rebel. He was very prideful and arrogant, and he was a, a mighty hunter and warrior, and he uh, was behind the Tower of Babel and built that first city of Babylon there. Now, which as we saw is in modern day Iraq. It's all, and we read about it in Genesis 11. And God destroyed uh, the Tower of Babel. Now, how do you say Babel? Well, it depends on who you talk to. I found all different pronunciations, and I actually use them different, differently sometimes too. So it can be uh, Babel is one way to pronounce it, Babel or Babel. 
So they, I got all different um, experts telling me how to do it. So um, I, I usually probably say Babel, but Babel, 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 different ways. In uh, 1983, Saddam Hussein started rebuilding the city of Babylon on its ancient site. He didn't get very far. If you were to go visit today, which you probably aren't going to Iraq anytime soon, but it's in ruins. But there's a, um, just you can just walk around, and there's um, all kinds of old artifacts artifacts lying around there. All right, so that's that first line, and then the next date there is uh, 700 BC. I didn't put the BCs in there. You can put that. In. So around 700 BC. That's Isaiah's day, that's what we're studying. We've been studying in Isaiah's day. And uh, Babylon uh, existed as a nation, but it was weak. It wasn't really a threat, as we already mentioned. Then 609, again, BC for that line there. If you wanna write in somewhere, that's when uh, Babylon defeated the Assyrians. Babylon defeated the Assyrians in that 609 BC. And then next we have 586 BC. And remember with BC, the numbers come down. So in 586 BC is when, and you should know that date. That's a date we keep saying. That's one of those dates you want to know is when Babylon conquered Judah, destroyed, annihilated Jerusalem. They did it in three different waves, but the final time when Jerusalem was destroyed was in 586 BC. And then the next date there is 539 BC, 539 BC. And that's when Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persians and the Cyrus was the, the king at that time. Cyrus, so Babylon was conquered by Medo-Persia, uh, Cyrus. We have one more date there. A number of things happened in between those two dates, um, but the final, it, Babylon then uh, started declining. Then in 331, Babylon was in, uh, invaded by Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great actually died there in Babylon. He was young and died there. Right, so from 331 ongoing, we have ruins. You see there's nothing there before the cross. And then after the cross, again, nothing with Babylon because it's all in ruins. But when we get to the end times, a lot is mentioned about Babylon. So at the, uh, left, uh, at the right-hand side of your chart, you say the, uh, the end or the tribulation. The end times, the tribulation. You might want to write in there Revelation 17 and 18. Revelation 17 and 18, and Isaiah 13, which is what we're studying today. And we know that Babylon will be completely destroyed during the tribulation. But here's the thing. When you read uh, Revelation, when you read those chapters, and when you read in Isaiah, it refers to a number of different types of Babylon. So the two ones that we're going to, that we see, uh, first of all, is the symbolic Babylon. So if, somewhere on your chart there, the symbolic Babylon. And uh, in end times, there will be this symbolic Babylon that's referred to as Babylon, referred to as the harlot, referred to as the woman, referred to as the prostitute. And I use a, an acronym, REP, to remember what the symbolic Babylon is, REP, which is Religious, Economic, and Political Kingdom of the Antichrist. REP, Religious, Economic, Political Kingdom of the Antichrist, is Babylon. So a lot of times Babylon is referred to, um, and it's just symbolic. Kind of like Wall Street in our day. Wall Street is a system, when we talk about Wall Street says this, or what's going on with Wall Street, and Wall Street is in danger, or, or whatever, um, it, it's, it's not necessarily a building that's talking to us, <laughs> all right? But Wall Street is also a place that you can go see and visit. So same thing with Babylon. It is this system, REP, uh, world system, um, that uh, again always symbolizes defiance against God and rebellion. But it also will be an actual place. It will be an actual city. And, and uh, a lot of Bible scholars believe it will be the capital city of the Antichrist. So there will have to someday be another Babylon built to have this during the tribulation because it's going to be destroyed during the tribulation and right now it's in ruins. So it will be an actual city, the capital uh, city for the Antichrist. So it will have to be rebuilt. So the world system, so the religious, economic, political world system will be destroyed during the tribulation, the one that defies God and the actual city 
um, that the capital for the Antichrist will also be destroyed during tribulation. I'm sure you have all that, and now we can go on. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but, but getting that kind of cleared up helps us as we get into the rest of it. And just so you know, we don't know who the Antichrist is. He could be alive right now, but he will not be revealed until after the church is raptured. So we don't need to try and figure out who it is. He is not going to be revealed until after the church is raptured. And then he will come on the scene and make order out of chaos and make everyone feel like, okay, it's going to be fine. We're going to be fine because I'm in charge type thing. All right, so we talked about the first four words of our text. We talked about the oracles and what they are, uh, ten of them. And we talked about Babylon. So we've got the Tower of Babel where it started. We've got the, the ancient historic Babylon. And we've got the future world system and capital city of Babylon. Okay, the oracle concerning Babylon, verse 1, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. So Isaiah knew what was going to happen. He knew that his beloved country, nation of Judah, and his beloved city, Jerusalem, was going to be destroyed, annihilated and captured. He saw all that. What a heavy burden to bear. And then the next phrase is the Lord talking to, let's say he's talking to some generals of an army. He's telling the generals it's time to fight. So here's the Lord talking to these generals saying, lift up a standard on the bare hill. So lift up a banner, get ready to invade, and a bare hill could mean, so it's very clear for all to see. There's nothing obstructing the view here. Here's the army. So lift up a standard so all can see. Raise your voice to them. So the Lord is telling the army generals, okay, get the army, tell the army it's time, raise a voice, and then wave the hand, beckon the army that they may enter the doors of the nobles. The doors of the normal, nobles probably refers to the gates of the capital city of Babylon. Again, this would have been back in uh, the ancient Babylon. And this army that's being called to come and invade would be the Medes, uh, the Medes that came, M-E-D-E, M-E-D-E, -E, the Medes, under Cyrus. We read in Daniel 5 that Darius received the kingdom, but historically it's Cyrus who was in charge and probably handed over to a sub-governor, Darius, then to, to uh, run it for him. And we see that in Daniel 5. So... So the partial fulfillment would have happened uh, when um, the Medes came and, and in um, 539 BC, when they came and conquered Babylon. That would be the partial fulfillment. The ultimate fulfillment will be in the end times. So here we have God talking to the generals. So we have this hill, we have a banner, we have shouting, we have the beckoning. It's time to come, God says, and conquer Babylon. And then the Lord is talking in verse 3, I have commanded my consecrated ones. Now normally when we think of consecrated ones, we think of righteousness and holy and just. But the word consecrated just means set apart. Set apart, chosen by God to be used by God for God's service, his instrument, his tool. So these consecrated ones here are talking about the Medo-Persian army, the, the military from the Medes that are going to come and do God's work, uh, fulfill his purposes, again, be his instrument. So God says, I've commanded them, I set apart ones, I've even called my mighty warriors, and the Medes were a very mighty, strong, powerful, a cr cruel group of warriors. He calls them my proudly exalting ones. They were proud and arrogant, but remember, they're doing God's work even though they don't know it. God called them to do this. Why? To execute my anger. So God has called them to punish Babylon. The armies of the Lord to execute his judgment, called by the Lord. So again, we have a partial fulfillment in 539 B.C., and the ultimate fulfillment will be during the end times. And here's what it sounds like. So Isaiah picks it up in verse 4 to talk about what it sounds like. A sound of tumult on the mountains. So you've got... Um, all these armies, like that of many people, a sound of the uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathered together. Cyrus did use people from many different nations because as he went in and conquered different nations, remember he would bring them back into captivity. So then when he uh, went out to conquer other places, he had people from a lot of different nations coming together. 
The Lord of hosts is mustering the army for battle. They are coming from a far country. We look at our map to see where the Medes live from the farthest horizons. The Lord and his instruments of indignation. Again, we see the anger and wrath of God. He is a, a loving, just, compassionate God, full of mercy and grace, but because he is holy and just, sin has to be punished or he would not be God. So now when we see in verse 5, the Lord and his instruments of indignation, those instruments, of course, are the Medes, then now we have to destroy the whole land, or some translations, the whole world. So now we're switching over into the end times. The whole world in the, that last battle during the end times. And um, if you take your handout that you wrote all over Babylon and turn it over, uh, those of you that are here, those of you um, watching online don't have this chart, I don't think, but we'll talk you through it. So this has a timeline here for us. You see the cross, and then you see it says church age. That's where we are now. We are living in the church age. As you see, the next thing to happen on God's prophetic calendar could happen today, could happen this morning, would be the rapture. We've got verses there for that. Then after the rapture, we'll begin the seven-year tribulation. And at the end of that seven-year tribulation will be this big battle that we're talking about. At the end of Revelation, it talks about destroying Babylon. So it's near the end of the tribulation. And then after the tribulation, and of course, uh, the tribulation ends at the second coming when Christ returns. And then after the seven-year tribulation will be the millennium, that thousand-year reign. We've been talking about that a lot. After the thousand-year reign... Our present earth will be destroyed and there will be a new heaven and a new earth and that talks about the future ages on the new earth and the new capital city of Jerusalem that will come down from heaven, um, a new Jerusalem, and that will be the, the uh, eternal kingdom, if you want to put eternal kingdom, uh, where we will all reign with Christ forever. So that we'll be referring to that now and then, so you might want to just keep that handy, but that's kind of tells you at the end of the tribulation when that final battle will happen that we're going to... So as we talk about this description here, in starting verse 6 and on, it, it does refer somewhat to the historical Babylon being destroyed by the Medes, but also to the ultimate uh, fulfillment of this prophecy at the end of the tribulation. It points to both. Uh, all right, so verse 6. God's coming to destroy the whole verse 6. Whale. For the day of the Lord, we already talked about what that meant, that's the tribulation, time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, all right, the tribulation, the day of the Lord is near, so the tribulation is near, it will come as destruction from the Almighty, so very clear, this isn't just something that, you know, it happens because nature is all upset, or, or you know, um, as we read about all the earthquakes and the floods and the uh, stars falling out and the meteors and and the pandemics and all this, it, where does it come? It comes as destruction from the Almighty, all right? Again, God is still in charge. Therefore, all hands will fall limp. So that's out, an outward appearance of people. And every man's heart will melt. That's how they are going to feel on the inside. So during that time of tribulation, and again, if we are believers, we will not go through the tribulation. We are going to be taken out because we will not experience God's wrath. Every man's heart will melt. They'll be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will rise like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment. Their face is aflame. When God pours out his judgment on the earth during the tribulation, people are going to be astonished that this is happening. Now, it's in God's word for all to read, and we should be sharing that with others. But it's kind of like they're going to realize they trusted in the wrong resources. They backed the wrong horse, so to speak. And they are going to be shocked that it's happening to them. Uh, we, we see in, in, our, um, in, our, in our world and in our culture and in our country at the leadership that they think they're in control. And they think they've got things figured out. But uh, um, for those who are not believers, uh, for those people that go through this tribulation, they are going to realize in the tribulation that they were wrong. Uh, near the end of the tribulation, they trusted in the wrong resources. So this anticipates and points to the, the eventual fall of the whole world system against God, not just historic Babylon, it refers to that also, but again, that's a type or a prefigure 
a prelude of the final destruction of all God's enemies. All right, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And again, it's future for us. It has not happened yet. It will start after the rapture. The worldwide day of the Lord. And again, because it is coming, as we're told over and over, it's coming, it's coming. All those other prophecies were fulfilled. This one will be also. It's coming. We need to warn others of this. Here's how it's described. Cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation. And it's talking about the whole world here, going to be made a desolation. And we studied Revelation a couple years ago, and we just saw the devastation um, that will be brought on this earth and how um, so many people will die and the rivers will be turned to, to blood and the uh, fish will die, the ocean life will die, uh, there'll be darkness, um, <clears throat> there will be so much fighting and, and death and plague and disease and and uh, terror. End of verse 9, and he, God, will exterminate its sinners from it, from the land, from the world. Verse 10, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, the moon will not shed its light. So we have universal darkness that will occur during the, uh, the tribulation. And we read about this in Revelation 6, verses 12 through 14 with the sixth seal. You know, the worthy lamb, Jesus Christ, will open the scroll that has seven seals. Under the sixth seal in Revelation 6, um, we read about this happening, this very thing, when the universal darkness will occur during the end times. God is speaking in verse 11, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. Over and over and over, we see this theme of God hates pride and arrogance. He hates those who live in rebellion and defiance against him. He is going to put an end to all of that. Then verse 12, God talking, I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. So there's going to be a lot of death the extermination of people. There won't be very many people that survive the tribulation compared to how many it will start out with. Verse 13, I will make, God talking, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place. So all of creation, heaven and earth, um, will experience the wrath of God, the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. And okay, that day is future the tribulation. All right, so a few more descriptions here, and this kind of goes back to ancient Babylon when they were invaded by the Medes, okay, starting at verse 14. And it will be like, it will be that like a hunted gazelle or like sheep with none to gather them. So they're going to be helpless. Babylon will be help, was helpless when the Medes came. No one came to help them. During the tribulation, there will be people helpless because God, it's the time of God's judgment. <clears throat> so talking about local judgment here on Babylon. Um, and then it says, they will each turn to his own people and each one flee to his own land. What is that talking about? Remember, Babylon had captured people from all different nations and brought them back to Babylon. Daniel. Um, was was one of those so brought them back so they're going to try during during that when the Medes come to invade they're going to try and escape and go back to their land um, just like during the tribulation people will try to flee they're going to try and flee however <clears throat> verse 15 anyone who is found will be thrust through anyone who's captured will fall by the sword so we have this slaughter here that happened to ancient Babylon and will happen during the tribulation their little ones also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses will be plundered, and their wives ravished. So this is the army, again, talking about the army of the Medes. They were very uh, depraved. They were cruel and savage. Um, and this, um, the savagery of fallen human nature, of course, sin is very destructive. So God is talking in verse 17, Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against them. So again, there's our confirmation. That that's why we know why, uh, who it is. 
It's also mentioned in Daniel that, um, that the Medes are going to be after the Babylonian Empire will be the Medes. And we saw that that's in, um, <clears throat> they come from modern day Iran and it's the Medo-Persian Empire, they ally together. So again, it's talking about 539 BC, but some of these conditions again will be the same in the end times. So these Medes will not, take val will not value silver or take pleasure in gold. It means they're not there for the money. No amount of money is going to pay them off. They want revenge. They're out to conquer this nation. And again, this was 539 BC with Cyrus, who actually was Persian, but they allied with the Medes. Okay, so um, on this next page, you might want to have your colored pencils handy. We'll talk about what, what these different um, pronouns and things refer to who we're talking about here. So however you marked... Uh, Babylon, um, and if you want to mark the Medes just with a capital M or something, however. Um, I started out marking them one way, I kind of changed how I marked, so I'm not going <coughs> to tell you how to mark it because you mark it however you've been marking it. Well, you could just put a capital M for Medes, a B for Babylon, however you want to do that. Okay, so verse 18, their bows, that's talking about the Medes, will mow down the young men, they, the Medes, verse 18, will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will their their eye, the Medes' eye, their Medes' eye, pity children. So they're going to kill the children. They're not going to have any compassion. They're just going to slaughter and kill everyone. 19, and Babylon, so again, if you want to mark that with a B, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans' pride. Remember we said Babylon, Chaldeans, same thing. Will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So what happened when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah? Total annihilation, totally destroyed. <coughs> So that's actually going to be in the future because um, when the Medes came, uh, they didn't totally destroy the city. They captured it, but they left the city and the walls standing. <clears throat> but in the future, that city of Babylon in the end times will be totally destroyed. Uh, verse 20, it, so that's Babylon, will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there in Babylon. Nor will shepherds make their flocks lie down there, Babylon. But desert creatures will lie down there, Babylon. No people, just animals. And there, Babylon, houses will be full of owls. Not people. Ostriches. How fun will that be? Will also live there, in Babylon. And shaggy goats will frolic there, Babylon. Hyenas will howl in there, Babylon fortified towers, and jackals in their, Babylon, luxurious palaces. Her, that's Babylon, fateful time also will soon come, and her, Babylon, days will not be prolonged. So we already went through a timeline of different uh, nations that are going to attack Babylon. It is in ruins now. Uh, about a mile from there is the city of uh, town of Hilla. Uh, there in Iran, but uh, as we said, there'll be a future time when it will become, it will be rebuilt, it will be the uh, capital for the Antichrist, and then it will be destroyed forever, and um, these will be the conditions there. So as we said, there are interim and partial fulfillments, and some of these things have not been fulfilled yet. They are ultimate, but uh, the people that Isaiah spoke to, and we, as we study Isaiah, can see that, well, these were fulfilled, Therefore, these other things will be also. All right, let's go into chapter 14. And we start out here in chapter 14 with God's compassion. And he chooses and brings people to Christ. And we are going to see uh, this applies again to at the end of the tribulation and, and the millennial kingdom. Um, and this is a fulfillment, verse, uh, starting verse 1, is a fulfillment of the promises God had made to Abraham and to David. So the millennial, we've talked about the, the Davidic covenant and how there would always be someone on David's throne and that, that there would be a remnant. And so, again, that's the millennium. We've talked a lot about the millennium. These, this first verse 1 here um, and 2 are about the millennial kingdom. Okay, so that's after the destruction of the final Babylon. So the tribulation is over, going into the millennial kingdom here, okay? So verse one, when the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel, 
So talking about here, we're going to say both the North and Southern Kingdom, Israel united, because we will have Israel from all 12 tribes in the Millennial Kingdom, unified one nation. It says again choose Israel. Uh, the first time he chose Israel, when he brought them out of Egypt and said, you're going to be my people. So that was the first time he chose them. Here he again choosing Israel. Again, just he's confirming these are my special people, my chosen people. And he's going to settle them in their own land. Then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. So again, talking about during the millennium when they're back in the land and there's going to be people from all different nations. That's a, during the millennial time, people from all different nations will also be in the millennial kingdom. So Gentiles, they're called strangers, another we could call them Gentiles, are going to attach themselves to the house, of, meaning they're going to be in the millennial kingdom with the Jewish, um, the, the remnant. Um, now there a, was a partial fulfillment because Cyrus allowed the exiles from Israel to go home. Um, so after 70 years of captivity in, in, in Babylon, they were allowed to go home. So under Cyrus, uh, he's going to allow, so that's a partial. They were back in their own land. But the, the ultimate fulfillment of that, has, this has not happened yet, as we will see. So the people, so this is Israel, if you want to mark that in blue or whatever. The people will take them, the strangers or the Gentiles, along and bring them to their place. They're going to bring them back to Israel. They'll be in Israel. And the house of Israel will possess them, these Gentiles, people from other nations, will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord. And they'll possess them as male servants and female servants. And they, the Jews, Israel, will take their Jewish, the Jews will take their captors captive and will rule over their, Israel's, oppressors. Now what does all that mean? Well, it means that during the Millennial Kingdom, there will be people from every nation that will come, but they will come gladly. They just like, we'll, we're part of that. We'll come gladly. Now, we didn't personally oppress Israel, but there will be people from all these other nations that did oppress Israel, and they will at some point come to Christ, and they will be part of all these people that are will, will, will be together with Israel during the Millennial Kingdom. And they, again, they come gladly. They come rejoicing. Um, and so we've already studied some of that. So Israelites will rule over the nations who used to oppress them, people from those nations that used to oppress them, and um, all be together during the millennium, okay? So verse 3, and it will be in the day, in the millennial time, when the Lord gives you, talking about Israel, gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved, I'm talking about all the different nations that enslaved Israel, that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Okay, so now we're going to be switching back between you know time periods here. So the king of Babylon, uh, again, again the Babylon came and captured the southern kingdom of Judah and took them into captivity. So um, we're going to be talking about this king of Babylon. Uh, represents, but he's going to represent all of worldly arrogance that defies God. But there was a king of Babylon, of course, that um, that you know the different human kings, but he's not named here. So we have to keep in mind uh, it's not just a person that, that was the king of Babylon, but also the whole wicked, evil system that Babylon represents. All right, so there's this taunt, and the word taunt here doesn't mean to jeer or to make fun of or mock, it actually means to speak truth, uh, to bring to light truth. So the, um, this truth is going to be spoken about the, the evil world system of Babylon and against the evil king of Babylon. Could be talking about Belshazzar. Uh, king Belshazzar was the king of Babylon when Cyrus came in and um, captured Babylon. But he's, the king's not named. So we're going to look at it as a lot of different kings of Babylon, but also the world, evil world system. So here's this, this truth they're speaking against Babylon. Um, Israel is speaking against Babylon. Verse 4, how the oppressor, and again, if you want to go through and mark everything with a, a B for Babylon or KB, king of Babylon, however you want to mark this. So how the oppressor, that's the king of Babylon or Babylon, has ceased. And how fury has ceased. He's not around anymore. 
Why? Verse 5, the Lord has broken the staff of the wicked. So that could be Babylon. The scepter of rulers. The Lord broke the staff and the scepter of Babylon. Which, that's talking to the sep about the scepter. If you want to draw a line from scepter to the word witch. Which used to strike the peoples, the, uh, Israel, in fury with unceasing strokes. So the scepter striking Israel. And which, also talking about the scepter, subdued the nations in anger with unrestrained persecution. But then, again, they're speaking from the standpoint of the millennial kingdom. So verse 7 the whole earth is at rest and quiet. They're at peace because Babylon is no more. Wickedness and evil is no more during the millennial kingdom. And they break forth into shouts of joy. They're joyful because wickedness has been destroyed. Not yet for us during the millennial kingdom. And they break forth into joy. Saying, Even the cypress trees rejoice over you. Babylon, or king of Babylon. I have a little crown. I put little crowns when it's the king. Even the cypress trees rejoice over you, and the cedars of Lebanon are rejoicing. That doesn't mean they're enjoying him. They're rejoicing in the fact that he's been destroyed. Since you were laid low, since you, Babylon, or king of Babylon, were laid low, no tree cutter comes up against us. So this is symbolic, saying the people are like trees, and they've not been cut down, won't be cut down anymore because Babylon has been destroyed. So the, the trees represent the people of Israel, and they're rejoicing. They will not be, have to worry anymore about the king of Babylon. All right, now here's our time where we're going to visit Sheol. Uh, some people call it hell. Uh, hell, that term can be confusing. It refers to all different things. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. So I want you to draw a little chart on page uh, 208, which is blank. You have a blank page 208, which is on the back of uh, the page we just went over. It should be facing 209. <laughs> anyway, or any place, but uh, that's a handy place to put it, is, is 208. So I want you to draw a, a, a rectangle and, and draw a line down the middle, split it into two parts. So you're gonna draw a rectangle, split it into two parts, and on the left side, put Hades, and on the um, right side, so you've got two boxes, one side's Hades, one is Abraham's bosom, Abraham's bosom. And above that box, you can put uh, Sheol slash Hades, Sheol slash Hades, it's called both. And this would primarily be during the Old Testament. So during the Old Testament, people that died went to Sheol. And Sheol means the place of the dead. And Sheol was divided into two parts. So we have our rectangle. This is Sheol or Hades. It's both names. Half of it we're going to call Hades, the place of, for the wicked dead. And Abraham's bosom is the place of, of blessing, the place for the righteous dead. Okay, but the, so Sheol, the place of the dead, had two sections to it. And so when people died, they went to one or the other in the Old Testament. They were divided by a great gulf. You couldn't get back and forth. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so in the New Testament, after Jesus was crucified, and, he wrote, and during those, those, those days before his resurrection, it, the Bible talks about how he went to Sheol, or to Hades, the place of the dead, and he took captives and brought them out. Most Bible scholars believe that means he took the section of Abraham's bosom and took it to heaven with him so that any believers who died after the resurrection of Jesus did not go to this divided section. They, went, they go right to heaven, and we know that from other verses in the New Testament. That's where believers now go. But they used to go to... Before the cross, they went to believers went to Abraham's bosom, and and it was kind of a waiting place of, of peace and rest and comfort, and um, but then Jesus. So that section no longer exists. That half, that Abraham's bosom, now no longer exists. Just Hades does. The other section of the place of the wicked dead, and someday everyone in that section will go to the lake of fire. 
that will be after the millennium, not till after the millennium, where everyone in, in Hades and, and, and unbelievers now that die go to, we say they go to hell. Uh, it's what the Bible first says, Hades. Um, and then they will eventually end up in the lake of fire after the millennium, and that we read about that in Revelation. All right, uh, and then, so all believers now go to heaven when they die immediately, and then at the rapture, we just talked about that a little bit. Um, those who are alive, well, I'll, wait, let me just hold off on that till we get to those verses, because I want to have that in front of me when we get to that. So anyway, that tells you a little bit about Sheol, which we're going to talk about now. Sheol, which we're going to talk about. So uh, let's go back to our text here to verse 9. So this is as if Israel is talking to the king of Babylon in verse 9. Sheol, from beneath, and we just talked about what that is, place of the dead, is excited over you, king of Babylon, to meet you when you come. So the wicked place of the dead, he's going to the wicked place, is so excited when he gets there. It, Sheol, verse 9, arouses for you, king of Babylon, the spirits of the dead, all the leaders of the earth. <laughs> interesting, all the leaders of the earth are going to end up in the place of the wicked dead. Very interesting. Um, of course, not all of them will. There's a, there's a lot of believers that are leaders. It, Sheol, raises all the kings of the nations from their thrones. So waiting in Sheol are all these other kings who've already died, all these other leaders. And when the king of Babylon gets there, they're going to throw a party. Oh, look, the king of Babylon is here. Now, there is no partying actually going on in this place. It's a place of torment and pain and separation from God. So a lot of this is symbolic, but it's just saying they're already there, you're going there, and you guys are all in the same place. So we learn from here, this is the place, Sheol is the place where the dead live. Remember, death is not a termination of anyone, but a change in places. Everyone lives forever. It just, de it just depends on whether you're going to live in hell and then the lake of fire, or whether you're going to live with the Lord for all eternity. But no one is annihilated. Nobody ceases to exist. It's just we change places where we are. We continue our personal identity. Uh, the, these, in hell they will be spirits forever, but they will never cease to exist. They will be weak. We see that they recognize one another. And they don't really sit on thrones, but the thrones are symbolic of the fact that they are the same people as when they were on earth. They, they didn't change who they were. They're, they're still people that used to be kings. And we also see that they can neither help nor hurt living people. So people that have died do not wander around as spirits. Ghosts are demons. If there are actual, there's a lot of demonic activity. Uh, but people that have died are either at this time in heaven or we call it hell. Uh, they'll eventually be in the lake of fire. They cannot get out. They cannot wander around. All right, let's go on. Verse 10. So these kings that are in Sheol are saying, they, these kings, will all respond and say to you, the king of Babylon, even you have been made weak as we are, ineffectual, weak, not able to help or hurt anyone. You, king of Babylon, have been made like us, the kings that are already there. Your pomp and the music of your harps, symbols of luxury, pomp and harps, look at the contrast, have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are your covering. So we've gone, gone from all this luxury and the king of the, the of, of nation, of this huge nation, to maggots and worms. Talking about the king. All right, now I want you to turn um, in your workbooks to page 89. Letter D, 89 letter D, and again, this talks about the rich man and the poor man. The rich man dies and goes to Hades. He did not go to Hades because he was rich. He went to Hades because he did not trust God. He did not, um, he did not believe in God. And so we see, learn some more things about Hades here. He's in torment. So anyone in Hades is in torment. Again, this was before, Jesus is telling this parable. It's a parable. He's telling a story. So there's still that second half of, of Hades, that Abraham's bosom. Lazarus, who did believe in God, is in Abraham's bosom. And we learn from this uh, that 
The rich man is in torment. He's burning up, and he asks for Lazarus to dip his finger in water <laughs> to cool his tongue. We don't know whether Lazarus could or not. Or I mean, by that I mean whether there was any water there. But uh, that, uh, but the rich man's asking for that. He is in agony, and he is in flames. It says there's a great chasm between those two sections. There's no crossing over. Uh, we see the the rich man and. And in, at least in this story, there's dialogue between the rich man and Abraham. Again, um, that may have just been for a point of the story. But he does, his primary concern, the rich man's concern, is that someone go warn his family. Go warn my family. Send someone to warn my family. I don't want them having to come here. And the answer was, they have Moses and the prophets, meaning they have scripture. They have scripture. If they won't listen to that, they won't listen. And again, that's such a warning to us. We need to warn our families and our loved ones and our friends of what's to come and where they will end up. And then we learn uh, letter E from 2 Corinthians 5, that to be absent for believers, to be absent from the body, so when we die, we will immediately be present with the Lord. So we don't have to have any fear or wonder what will happen. We, the, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us there, if we die, we are immediately with the Lord um, as a spirit. And then um, on page 90, number two from Philippians one, Paul talks about departing, meaning dying, and being with Christ is so much better than staying here. Amen? I think we would all say that. <laughs> to depart and be with the Lord is so much better uh, than staying here. I was thinking, and, and you probably thought about this or heard this too, that you know when Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead, after he was dead for four days, um, Lazarus probably was, what are you thinking? What are you doing here? I did not want to come back. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, number 3 there, talks about if we are alive when Jesus returns. And I want to um, read those verses from 1 Thessalonians 4, um, starting with verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, those believers who have died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. We believers are not to grieve like unbelievers do. They have no hope for the future. We have hope. And he goes on to say what it is. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him, will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So that's talking about the rapture. At the rapture, those who are falling asleep in Jesus means just during the church age, not the Old Testament saints, but during the church age, um, those who are already in heaven right now at the rapture, they're going to come with Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, the rapture, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, those who are already dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, are you listening for it? Are you ready? It could happen at any time. Are you ready to move? Or are you so firmly entrenched here? You don't want to move. How invested are you here versus longing for heaven? And who are you taking with you at that time? Which could happen at any time. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, the dead in Christ, those who died during the church age, will rise first. So, their bodies are in the ground, their souls are with Jesus, and they're coming back with Jesus. Their bodies are going to rise first and be reunited with their soul, and it'll be a glorified body, their forever body. Then we who are alive and remain, so if this were to happen right now, we're the ones who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them. Those bodies that are going up and be reuniting with their souls, we're going to go up with them, but we don't precede them. They go up first. We'll go up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is really good news. That is great, right? And it could happen at any time. Now, the Old Testament saints will not get their bodies until after the tribulation. Um, so um, they, they'll have to wait a little bit longer. But anyway, okay, so that's that. Let's finish up here. So back to verse 12. We were talking about the king of Babylon and he's in Sheol and they're continuing to talk about him. Now as we talk here about the king of Babylon, he is also a type of Satan. 
So it's referring to the king of Babylon, but it's also talking about Satan. We'll go through this section um, pretty quickly here. How you, so again, king of Babylon or Satan, if you want to mark all these you's, it refers to the king of Babylon, but also Satan. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. So those words, son, star of the morning, son of the dawn, is the shining one, which means Lucifer. That's where we get the name Lucifer for Satan, the morning star, shining one. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, so here's the attitude of Satan and the king of Babylon, look at all these I will, I will, I will. I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, I will sit in the mount of assembly, in the recesses of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will make myself like the most high. Wow, what an attitude. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Look at verse 15. Nevertheless, you, so Satan, king of Babylon, will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. And those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble? Who shook the kingdom? Who made the world like a wilderness and overthrew its cities? Who did not allow his prisoners to go home? So a lot of that is about the king of Babylon. And all the kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb. Verse 19, but you have been cast out of your tomb like a rejected branch, clothed with the slain who are pierced with the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a trampled corpse. So what it's saying here that a lot of kings, they got buried in these great big monuments, mausoleums, honorable burials, but not the king of Babylon. He doesn't have a tomb. He's... Um, he does not have an honorable burial, but he's covered with dead bodies and trampled on. A trampled corpse, an unmarked grave walked on. It goes on to say in verse 20, you will not be reunited with them in burial. They're going to get buried, not you. Because you, again, king of Babylon, have ruined your country. You have slain your own people. May the offspring of evildoers not be mentioned forever. And here was the custom as when a king was, a, a wicked king was overthrown or assassinated, they would also kill all his descendants so they could not rise up again. So, verse 20, prepare his son, prepare for his sons a place of slaughter because of the iniquity of their fathers. They must not arise to take possession of the earth and fill the face of the earth with cities. They kill all the descendants um, so there were no potential challengers to the throne later on. And this is also talking about the fact that there will never be a revival of the Babylonian Empire, the actual physical Babylon. There will be a city Babylon, but not the Babylonian Empire. All right, and then verse 22, the Lord says, now we just read, they must not arise, the wicked world system. But in verse 22, I will rise, says the Lord, against them, and will cut off from Babylon's name and survivors, offspring and prosperity, declares the Lord. So all evil and defiant ones will someday be cut off to rise no more. They will not exist. And we contrast that with God's promises to the remnant, that there will always be a remnant and that they will be restored and they will reign with the Lord forever. Verse 23, I will also make it, Babylon, a possession for the hedgehog and swamps of water, and I will sweep it with the broom of destruction. What a picture of taking a broom and just sweeping everything about Babylon out and gone. 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened, and just as I have planned, so it will stand. I have a big smile face there, and I wrote, Yay! <laughs> and... Um, this is so wonderful that, again, our God is sovereign. He is in control. Our lives are pre-planned. Every day is pre-planned. God is in control. And this definitely goes with our memory verse because we do not have to live in fear. We can be at peace because God is in control. Then we're going to go back in time to Assyria. Verse 23, God says, Just as I have planned so it will stand to break Assyria in my land, I will trample him, Assyria, on my mountains, then his Assyria's yoke will be removed from them, that's from Israel, and his burden, Assyria's burden, removed from their, Israel's shoulders. This goes along with uh, Isaiah 10, 27, the yoke and the burden, 
and how that Babylon is going to break the yoke of Assyria. God's going to use Babylon to break Assyria, then he's going to use the Medes to break Babylon. So this is a partial fulfillment that has already happened, but then a future, the ultimate fulfillment during the end times. Verse 26, this is the plan devised against the whole earth, end times, and this is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations during the tribulation. So what this means is what happened to Assyria is a model of a type of what will happen during the end times to all, the whole world. And verse 27, for the Lord of hosts has planned and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? What God has declared, decreed, determined will happen. Nothing can stop that. That is our great God. That is our Savior, our salvation, our song, our shield, our everlasting rock. How blessed and thankful we are. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so thankful for our salvation, and we love your word. Thank you for all these truths and, and, and prophecies and principles that you have given us that you want us to learn and study and know about and apply and use and share with others. Help us to do that, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.